thanks uh, all of you for joining me in the panel. So look, I mean, um, you guys have all been at the forefront of you know the digitizing economy. You have founded companies. You have you have supported the companies. You have helped them grow. Uh, as I mentioned today, we will try to you know track the evolution of the businesses and see how financing decisions have uh, impacted those or supported those, and potentially that will allow us to segue it into a bit about how banks can you know evolve a little bit more to to support this you know so we see that all the startups typically um, have started with an unmet need they have found a gap in how products and services were delivered and how that could be done better and then uh, they veer around when they look into capturing value or creating value there is always or at least we have seen that from payments, there's a movement into credit tech. From insurance, there's a movement towards underwriting. Uh, from, you know, even e-commerce, we are seeing a movement towards BNPL. Uh, and someone like, uh, you know, Aaron, your business, you have seen from a very big beginning, perhaps, that there is a lot of value to be captured in the financing. So if we were to dwell, I mean, the topics or the themes that we will touch is, as your business grew, how did the decisions around financing evolve? Then at what point did you really feel the need for debt capital and what was the reaction from the capital markets, be that the markets or be that the financial institutions like us? And then I will also touch a little bit upon when we look into the continuum of debt solutions today. I mean, for early stage, we have venture debt. For we are seeing some emergence of ecosystem-based financing where people are partnering to do co-lending, people are partnering to help the you know, ecosystem, whether it's merchant financing and stuff like that. And then when the companies become slightly more mature, there is pure structured corporate debt. So we will touch upon you know, the suitability of these alternatives as we grow. So Aaron, maybe I'd like to start that you actually started with a digitizing a decision which is a very high sort of touch point decision in the sense it's a it's a decision where a, a guy is trying to buy a car it's 70 80 100 thousand dollar now usually people want to touch and feel now you have digitized that at what point did you start feeling that from that being the basic proposition of your service at what point did you say that actually financing is also or potentially the more value accretive from it? Yep. And how did that impact your financing decision? For us, I mean, we, we basically run what we call this Amazon.com for cars, right? Yeah. Across Southeast Asia. And honestly, when we look at financing, it is uh, it, is, it was actually super important. Right? From day zero, I often get asked this question many times by you know VCs or even like other entrepreneurs. How much have my business plan changed? Uh, since I started uh, thinking about the company to you know to today, like five years on, right? The long and short of this is that you know our business plan has, hasn't really changed. And if you look at my my deck, and I think Kabir can attest to that, <laughs> the long and short of this is that our business, uh, when we first started it, we have always had financing in mind, right? We have always had insurance in mind. We always had warranties in mind. We always had after sales in mind. So when I when I first started this this whole business, the long and short of this is that we we actually drew this. I guess today people call that uh, what's this the hyperloop thing? We had what we call hyperloop. What's this? The flywheel. Flywheel, flywheel right? Flywheel. Flywheel. Something flywheel. called flywheel these days, especially within the startup world, right? Like Copang has it and stuff like that. And uh, at that point in time, we didn't have that, but we had something called a hyperloop of sorts, right? But how we thought about this was like, okay, we start with selling the car or buying a car for a customer, and then if we sell them a car, we typically then do the financing, get the insurance sorted out, uh, you know, provide warranties provide the assurance for the vehicles itself and then all towards the after sales side of things. And then when the customer is ready to sell, we also provide the best price, if not you know, the fastest service or so for the customers. Right? And then when they're ready to buy, it starts all over again. So you know, the way we think about life as a company really is to, is, to, is to own that whole ecosystem end to end. So to answer your question point blank for us, financing by itself is super critical. And also going back to how big the ticket size of a, of a, of a vehicle is. Of course, in Singapore, four, five, three times more higher than any other places that you can go globally to buy a vehicle itself. But let's just say that on average, 
uh, GDP adjusted, right? GDP per capita adjusted. I mean, the truth is that it's still a very large ticket purchase. In fact, the second largest ticket after a property by itself. And as a result, financing is, is super important. I mean, in Singapore itself, statistically, I can tell you that 80, 90% of the people, I mean, most of us in this room, typically, of course, if you are a banker, I mean, the bankers typically will say, you know what, I don't borrow money from uh, to buy a vehicle because they do, they do know that uh, financing for a vehicle is pretty expensive. But let's just say that for the bulk majority of us, 80-90% uh, of them and across Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia where we operate, the truth is that most people actually do finance when they, when they take a car. And for us these days, because a lot of our business is retail, what, what this means is that um, if we do not play within the financial services space itself, uh, we realize that a lot of our customers remains to be underserved. Or for that matter, not even just underserved, the truth is that they will not be able to purchase the vehicle itself. And that actually further reinforces the need for us to start uh, the financial services business, which we did and thankfully, we did so more than four years ago now. So today, we know we run a loan book, and thanks in, in part, actually a big part to DBS, uh, you know, uh, over $200 million in size, right, uh, uh, across uh, across a few markets itself. But let's just say that, um, you know, if we didn't start back four years ago, uh, we wouldn't have learned what we have learned. We wouldn't have gone through this COVID cycle of, you know, credit crunch, being able to deal with, you know, things like uh, uh, mor loan moratoriums in my, in my <laughs> wildest dream, I haven't even thought of that. But let's just say that, all said and done, that was super important and financing by itself is, is something that we've thought of since day zero. And uh, I'm just happy that the team executed well on that. And I think the four or five years in, you know, I, we have built a very strong uh, financial services business within the group itself. Yep. Great. So I think the, uh, the question that I wanted to also ad uh, get addressed by you was, at that time when you decided that you wanted to get into financing of cars, at that point where you totally equity financed or you were already thinking that maybe for the financing part, I'll have to partner with banks yep. or was there an interlude between when you could actually access banks to that and initially you had to only do it through your own equity yeah. that you were raising? Yeah. So from day zero, I mean, when if you are lending companies, I mean, if you are lending uh, as a company, because look, we are a marketplace at the start, yeah. right? So for us, we were never set up to lend in that sense. But if you want to do lending, the only way you have to do it is to work with the bank because nobody else has a lower cost of capital than the bank. It's as simple as that, right? So for, from, from the start, from the get-go, we were looking for banks to work with. And, you know, not because DBS invited me and that's why I have to say this, but the, the truth is that um, DBS was the only bank, and I stated the only bank, not even the first bank, the only bank, not the first bank we spoke with, but the only bank that actually gave us the first, I want to say $10 million, right? Um, uh, that gave us this, what we call block discounting line, which probably most of you <laughs> wouldn't know what it means, but... Uh, that 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 was that allowed us to actually start the business, and subsequent to which, when the other banks, so to speak, saw this, it's like, oh, you know, DBS gave you this line, and that further reinforces the reason why you know the, whatever we do is safe and for that matter profitable, and as a result, the other banks then you know hop onto the bandwagon. But to answer your question point blank, if you start a lending business, and I think Kelvin will add to that, the long and short of this is that you have to rely on borrowings now, be it from banks, institutions, or even angel investors. Early days when we first started, when we had nobody to borrow from, we actually borrowed money from our earliest investors. And then we landed out against that, right? We, we sort of yeah. like, you should, I wouldn't say bond, but you know, we just basically borrowed money and then we just, we just lend it out and then we just give them a coupon every quarter or so. Yeah, but high level, that's it. Understood, understood, good. Uh, maybe, uh, David, I will come to you. Like, you have a lot of, uh, in your entire portfolio, you have fintech, credit tech companies. I wanted to understand from your perspective that you see them through early stage to all the way to growth. Now, some of them are already unicorn stage, maybe looking at exit. So how do you see the interplay between equity and debt? And at what stage did you start seeing the companies either being suitable or when you thought they are suitable, but the market was still not willing to receive and when they were sort of able to access debt? And some takes, some open takes on that from your side, maybe. Sure. So, you know, as an early stage investor, I think we are as sensitive to dilution as our founders are. And so obviously, the more the company can start to access lower cost to raise capital uh, and become more efficient, you know, the better they are. Um, you know, debt is, uh, you know, much more efficient than uh, equity, uh, from a, particularly from a dilution perspective. But I think as you get earlier stage, you get increased risk. And with increased risk, you get increased interest. And so, you know, most of your traditional lenders will say, you know, if I'm going to go into an earlier stage company or into a business model that I, I don't 
fully understand I'm going to charge higher rates. And then it's the trade off of, well, you know, how accessible is this debt and what do I, what do I really pay for it versus raising another equity round? Um, but, uh, you know, I agree that the, the state of the ecosystem, you know, there's been an enormous level of evolution over the last five, you know, six, seven years. I think there'll be even more. The products that are available to startups today are, you know, very different than they were five years ago. And so, and I think if you flash forward five years again, I think a lot of the lenders will be more sophisticated. I think they'll look at more interesting products. Um, you know, certainly there are some businesses in our portfolio, like Rachel, you know, that would benefit from working capital financing or, you know, that have longer cash conversion cycles because they're inventory based. Mm -hmm. And so if they can use debt to offset some of those, you know, fundamentally their business model is not that different from a traditional trading business. But because they're working, you know, in a, they're a startup and they're, you know, a digital, you know, native business the perception of that, I think, and their accessibility to different types of financing, I think, is is not as easy, or it requires a certain you know level of scale for them to start to, for those products to start to apply, and so. But I think a lot of that will change over time. I think things will become more accessible. You know, there's a lot of foreign uh, debt providers that are coming into the region. Yeah. Um, if you think about the BNPL space. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, European or U.S. debt capital that's coming in to fund those credit books. Yes. And then as those credit books get funded, they say, well, what other businesses are in the region? What other, you know, uh, what else is happening? And then they'll start to, to dabble in different different sectors, you know. And, you know, I'm a firm believer in Mark Andreessen's quote, which is every startup is a fintech. You know, I think every startup will derive some sort of their revenue through financial services you know, whether it be they're providing credit to some of their customers or passing down credit or through payments or through other means. Um, but, you know, I, I think just like the region, there is a segment of unbanked consumers. There's a larger segment of underserved financial customers in the region. I think there's a large proportion of underserved startups in the region. You know, there's a lot of demand that's out there for financial products and services, whether it be working capital financing or just straight debt, um, that's just underserved today. But I, I think that'll change over time. Good, good, good. Lots good. of opportunity for banks. Yeah, I mean, we'll touch upon that, whether we are ready for those opportunities or we are lagging. But maybe, Kelvin, at that point, I'd like to come to you, because you are actually, your core business is lending. You know, you started with it. So uh, when, I wanted to understand, when, you, when investors look at you, you, you have equity investors, and you have also partners who are financing. Is there a perverse kind of incentive? When, because certain equity investors may take a view that while uh, you know, they, the company may struggle with access to uh, debt, it's a good opportunity for us to pump in more equity. When you actually can, if you work harder, you could take debt. Because they are seeing at it from a risk-weighted perspective that you're, you know, Besides getting into details, maybe your gross level earnings are way higher than what a safe equity investor would like. So do you see that in the interplay when you're talking to your own equity investors and all? Firstly, the reason I'm on mass not because I did a nose job or plastic surgery. It's just because I have an infant at home. So in a risk-based business, I'm hypersensitive towards risk, right? So risk for my baby. Um, but I think to your question on on uh, the interplay with equity investors, what we did do realize is that actually is highly complementary because I think money attracts money. Mm -hmm. In fact, we, we partner with a lot of VCs or even uh, venture debt companies to, to co-land together because at the end of the day, most of the equity investors, like what I think David mentioned, they do want to be further diluted. So one way to extend their runaway is frankly to partner with financiers, like uh, fin financing platforms like ourselves, be it in terms of revenue-based financing, which frankly, a lot of traditional financial institutions probably are less open towards financing at this point in time or other non-typical non structures per se. So actually what we see is that a lot of VCs or even to a smaller extent, smaller PE houses are actually quite keen to partner with us just to help them to extend a runway, to grow the business or even to bridge the two, three months when by, hey, I've already signed a term sheet, I'm going through confirmatory DD, can I just bridge that financing as before the money comes in so that I don't miss that seasonal growth uh, mm. to, to, to stock up early. Understood. And, and in that, uh, when these investors as debt providers, let's say, are coming in and helping you, do you see 
uh, that their expectation of return is much closer to the equity guy because they're saying, actually, I'm bridging an equity round. So I'm literally taking an equity risk on this. Uh, do you see something like that? Or you're saying that this is more a different evaluation They're actually looking at it from a debt risk perspective? I think we frankly see it purely more at a debt risk basis, uh, hmm. because, but of course we also de it depends on what, from whom the term sheet you receive, what is the reputation of VCs, have they break their promises before, hmm. uh, and what is the context of the market, will the macro context for the result of false mergers and so forth. So, so generally, at least for as far as we are concerned, we see it more as a debt risk perspective, but we also consider the fact that um, in the event that if does uh, if things do go awry, what are the recalls that we may have? And also, also what is the level of margins on a business and what kind of rates that can actually sustain? Because at the end of the day, you just can't earn more than what the gross margin of a business is, right? If not, it's a negative NPV deal for, for the SME. Good. So maybe, Kabir, coming to you, uh, in your portfolio, you have, from a, purely from a geographical perspective, you have a wide array. I mean, you have a lot of companies in US, in India, and also in Southeast Asia. My first question to you is, do you see a different level of maturity uh, when it comes to, say, U.S. as compared to Southeast Asia uh, with respect to businesses of financial institutions who are willing to provide debt or structured debt, and similarly, a different level of maturity in the founders in their openness in being you know, able to take structured solutions as opposed to you know, looking at equity and then just comparing, okay, debt comes with strings attached, so I don't want to take it. Um, you know, both first from a geographical perspective from the supply side and then from a demand side. Yeah, so, you know, we invest across the U.S., U.S. and Asia, and both equally weighted U.S. and Asia. Uh, you know, I'd say, you know, two, three areas. I think one from an ecosystem standpoint, yes, there are natural differences. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, at some level we were talking about earlier, but Silicon Valley, you know, this started like 40, 50 years back. Uh, the differences even in the U.S., right? You look at a market like New York, it's really started to kind of come up as a fintech hub, but really more in the last 10 years. And so there are natural differences that you see from an ecosystem maturity. So that's kind of one part I'll talk about that. Um, I think from a... From a business standpoint, I think in a way you're actually seeing a lot more similarities. Uh, and then you're seeing in some areas where, you know, parts of Asia are probably leapfrogging and, uh, and ahead of the curve, right? So it depends on what business you're looking at. Uh, if you think about founders and founder quality, you know, I, I would say, you know, there are, they, you're just meeting some fantastic founders across the globe. And so I think there's a lot more consistency on that front. But the ecosystem maturity is just, it's going to take some time, right? So, you know, when we start investing, um, which is in 2016, the internet economy here was a $30 billion internet economy. And I, I remember we were chatting, and I remember the, there was a conference after conference at that time, which was, you know, there's a big Series B gap. Uh, what's going to happen after all the companies raise money? Then will they have access to new capital or not, right? And you've, now you fast forward, the internet economy in this region is going to about $100 billion. And if you fast for another three, four years, it'll be about a $300 billion internet economy, right? So you're seeing the internet economy in the region scale up really well. Uh, the pools of capital are changing. So, you know, earlier the big question was, will there be bigger pools of capital? Will they come? They've come. They've seen the opportunity in the region. They've come. Um, you know, we were talking about, at that time, the big question on exits. Will you have IPOs? How are you going to exit the business? They're coming. They, you're starting to see strong exits, IPOs. Uh, interest with SPACs, other avenues for founders to kind of have exits. I think the ecosystem maturity on debt, uh, that still needs to mature. I think it's great to see DBS take that leadership role, uh, but it needs to mature. We were talking about like one of our portfolio companies, Ninja Van, it's gone from $2 million to a $1 billion. But even 12 months back when we were speaking about access to other pools of capital, working capital, it takes time. It's taking a long time even for a company which is now raised, you know, 700 millions of dollars, unicorn status, it's taking a lot more time to access debt. Uh, then again, quant types of debt, there's venture debt, there's working capital. I think there's some, some maturity that needs to happen. But it's great if, if um, you see, you know, the ecosystem kind of lean in there because there's a big opportunity there. Um, so I think to answer your question, you know, ecosystem has matured. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's a great time to be in Asia. Uh, it's a great time for founders to kind of be in the region, but you know we also see pools of capital like debt needs to kind of uh, lean in a bit more. Um, 
so uh, just following on, I mean, in your portfolio also, we see from a sectoral perspective, you have a lot of enterprise software companies, which are SaaS kind of. Then there are consumer, uh, pure consumer outreach types. And then there are, uh, you know, slightly asset heavy kind of businesses. So in this, uh, do you see that there's a bias where the asset heavy businesses have a tendency that they can actually, or they are more likely to access the debt capital markets. Similarly, uh, wanted to get your take on for the SaaS kind of solutions. Should there be certain, you know, structured working capital solutions from banks, which, which will work for them because, I mean, prior to this you were mentioning, and we have also seen this, that there's a typical sort of a cash trough that they go through, all the SaaS companies. So what's your take? What should banks or financial institutions like us do uh, to evolve along these lines? I mean, I mean, what should people do and think about for the sectors that you are in? Yeah, I think it's similar, and maybe, um, and you're probably already doing that, um, which is like each of these business models, there are different nuances there, right? So we talk about SaaS, we can talk about FinTech, we can talk about if you're serving small, medium merchants, what it means, right? But take an example of SaaS. I think that one, for example, you do see often, we have discussion on boards of several SaaS companies, uh, you do see this very interesting, uh, interesting thing playing out where the faster a SaaS business grows because of the nature of SaaS, right? It's recurring revenues. On the revenue side, you sell whether it's your $100,000 or $400,000 type of projects per, per customer. But you, your expenses are all upfront. You're paying a sales and marketing upfront. You're, you're spending on marketing upfront. So the faster you grow, you actually get a deeper cash trough, right? And so if you're sitting there and you're not used to that, you're like, hey, what's going on? You're growing 60% versus 80% versus 100%. And your cash trough becomes, or the cash burn goes sharper because you're actually scaling a lot more. You're paying your sales team. You're, you're building on marketing. Uh, but the recurring revenue will come you know, month after month. It kind of hits the cash register. But those are very attractive businesses, right? And so there is an opportunity, for example, for institutions to think about that and how do you kind of lend to that. Uh, the other one is for businesses that are serving small and medium merchants, right? We, we spoke about that. It's such an important part of the economy, whether you took, look at a you know, market like Indonesia, you know, 50% of the GDP could be related in some shape or form to small and medium merchants. And then are, is there enough access of capital that those merchants have or businesses or tech businesses selling to the small and medium merchants? Again, a different way of looking at it um, a different way where someone's thinking about you know, your own underwriting uh, needs to be probably tweaked, but those are very interesting opportunities. So I think there are some business models which need to be thought of slightly differently. And then are there pools of capital, are there you know, pools of debt that can access them? I think it's definitely a very interesting opportunity. Just uh, one short point. If the audience has any questions, um, there is a QR there that, that leads you to the pigeon hole. You can ask, and I will subsequently ask them. So uh, maybe, um, Aaron, I'll come back to you a little bit. Uh, so uh, you know, you have mentioned about how you partnered with some banks, et cetera. But going forward from here, what are the incremental technological changes you're seeing? Your, your business model, we understand, which is building a whole ecosystem. But from a technology perspective, what kind of changes you are seeing, and to that extent, do you have an expectation for a financing partner? Like uh, going forward five years, perhaps uh, you know certain things like you see today may not be the way it is. And you would like to, you, being where you are, you are already foreseeing that. So to that extent, would you expect some something from a financing partner? Like what what could be the product or the uh, thing that would... Yeah, maybe I wouldn't say too much from a product standpoint. I mean, look, yeah. I can go into a lot of details about computer, I mean, computer vision, acoustic stuff, if you guys are interested. But I think that's less relevant for, yeah. for the bank in that sense. But I would say that uh, one of the many things that I feel that is an increasing pain for me, I mean, there's, there's a few things, a lot of things actually. Uh, but for a company right now, because uh, you know we, we do have ambitions to go public and stuff, right? So yeah. which basically means that we have a lot of things that is going on in and around controls, in and around ERPs and stuff like that. I think one of the many things I, I recently told people is that please, you should start using ERP solutions as much as you can, right? Mm. Uh, do not use the, the simple accounting software so it will come back to bite you at some point. Uh, but 
but I think all said and done, my, actually one of my biggest learning recently was that um, I'm, you know, as as banks or, or not even as banks, but as a, as a startup ourselves, we are looking to to work closer with uh, with bank with a uh, with a more regional slash global presence in that sense, right? Mm. So so on that note, from a technology stack standpoint, we would really love to be able to integrate with one bank that can really push out out across uh, across the world. Say tomorrow, if I want to start in I don't know, I'm just making it up. We're not going to do that. But let's say we start in China or even in the United States, right? How do we launch tomorrow like this, right? How do mm. we make sure that um, at the end of the day, what, whatever systems and platforms that we do when we launch in, in China or US or in any random markets that we're in, like in Australia, uh, we will then be able to uh, seamlessly, right, integrate with our backend, right? And, and then from that standpoint, then allow us to, to integrate into the whole ERP suites and stuff and whatnot, right? So in other words, what I'm saying is that really, what we're looking for is a bank that that is, as I think Sushan was mentioning just now, right? This this enabler, right? This, uh, as Sushan said, disappearing bank per se, right? Yeah. And, I, and I fully agree with that statement, right? Which is, at the end of the day, the the bank that we are looking to partner with at the end, I, I really don't need to go to the, any of the the branches ever again, right? But I would love for the fact that, simplistically, from a programmer standpoint. You know, write one line of code, a few lines of codes here and there, and just get our money sorted out, right? A loan sorted out and stuff like that, and all through a single API call, right? Now, with that, then everything then on our end just flows through to the various uh, you know, buckets, so to speak, where we, where we do our ERP integrations and stuff. I think that's the, the, the way I think about life. But of course, easier said than done, every single jurisdiction has its own set of rules, set of laws and stuff like that. And that's why I guess everyone is so, I mean, not everyone, but a lot of people are so excited about, you know, DeFi, decentralized, you know, blockchain technology, where we talk about the fact that when the banks are, or rather when, when monetary systems are, are, are decentralized, right? yeah. when there are all this sort of like ability for us to transact now cross border without all these worries about, you know, yen convert, converting to SGD, which is our baseline currency as a Singapore company and stuff like that. Then this is where it's interesting whereby, you know, you know, we we, we can uh, theoretically open up a business in any countries without the need to worry about currency exchanges, differences, right? The need to integrate with multiple banks in one single time and stuff and whatnot, right? So on a high level, what I'm saying really at the end of the day is I'm looking for a global bank that is decentralized without too much uh, license restrictions, if you may, right? Yeah. And then uh, that I can do business with without ever needing to visit a single branch. I think that's how I imagine the future of banking should be, right? I don't know. Correct, correct, yeah. correct. So, so th that lends to a natural advantage. You're saying that that a global bank has over a regional bank, but could and DBS uh, is a global bank, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm just thinking that potentially then one model could be that a bank, even if it may not be a global bank, I mean, let's be honest, sure, we sure. are not really comparable from a footprint perspective to a Citibank or a HSBC. But if we really had the systems and processes to integrate with you and then maybe at the back end, uh, I mean, even if there is another financial institution which is in United States, let's Correct. take the example, yeah. some some pure lenders who have the license to lend money in US, yeah. let's say, they can integrate, but then they can integrate through a pl banking platform yeah. like ours who yeah. are who are completely sort of solutioning for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, I understand. Uh, that's good, actually. But maybe diverting a little bit, David, I wanted to touch upon uh, another topic, which is uh, you are a GP who is now managing, uh, you are now in your fourth fund. So from a financing perspective, from the GP side, you know, we, of course, have seen the subscription financing facilities and all of that. But are there other options and solutions like, I mean, we were recently uh, partnering with one such GP where when they were raising their next fund, uh, their contribution was actually funded by way of a privately placed bond. So that's just, I mean, one solution potentially. Uh, I was wondering from your expectations perspective, are there things that you would want a financial institution or a bank to do so that it makes, you know, people are willing to take a view on your stream of cash flows coming from carry or stream of cash flows coming from your management fees. Uh, is there some thoughts around that? I mean, what could help the GPs? Sure. So I always joke that, you know, we're a series B stage company. You know, we've, um, we now have the team in place. We've been around for, you know, almost 10 years. Um, we're starting to implement systems and processes and, you know, all the things that you would expect to see a post kind of series B company do. But, 
you know, venture is a business. Mm -hmm. um, there is a business model. It's a very stable business model. Um, once the fund is raised, we have a stream of fees. Um, there can be a global financial crisis. There can be a pandemic. Um, we'll never turn to our employees and say, we're really sorry, revenue is off this month. Um, we're going to have to let you know, a lot of you go. And so from a financing perspective, it becomes, it's a very stable business. Um, you know, we have to work within our means. Um, there's no way to generate incremental revenue. If I went to one of our companies and said, you know, I, I want you to pay me $200,000 just sitting on the board, and they said, yes, we'll pay you $200,000, our fees decrease by $200,000. And so, you know, it is what it is. Um, and so we manage within that, but it also creates opportunities to raise incremental capital off, of, off the back of that income stream. Mm -hmm. So if you think about Kabir's point in terms of the evolution of the ecosystem, in 2015, we had a $10 million line from Silicon Valley Bank uh, for our second fund. Not a huge amount of money. They didn't make very much. Um, in fund two, we had a $20 million line, a little bit better. Um, we now have a U.S. $50 million line mm -hmm. um, with Silicon Valley Bank. And so, you know, as the fund sizes increase, as the ecosystem increases, the materiality of the businesses increase the opportunity to monetize those into great partnerships become much greater. You know, there's, I think, a frustration across venture capital in Southeast Asia today because Silicon Valley Bank has a suite of services and products for general partners in Silicon Valley in the U.S., and none of those are available in Southeast Asia. And so in the lead up to every new fund, we finish investing out of a fund and we start raising the next fund, and there's a gap usually of about four to six months. Yeah. And so with every fund, we warehouse. And so we go to friends and family, and we say, can you please give us some debt? And we pay an interest rate, and we cobble together a few million dollars, and we continue to make investments. And then when the fund has a first close, we fold those into the fund. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's no structured facility. Um, you know, There's no banks in Singapore that will give us you know, that credit line, um, despite the assets, despite the funds flow um, that we have coming in. And so I, I think, like I said before, the, the ecosystem is in a state of evolution. I think it will continue to, 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 to develop more. More products will become available. And I think there's a, a lot more um, money to be made. I also think that, you know, there's a lot of great founders uh, in Southeast Asia who, because of IPOs and because of exits, will also become private wealth you know, customers, you know, I, I think we have a strong belief within our firm that, you know, all of our founders, it's, it is like a marriage, you know, you sit on someone's board, you help them from inception all the way through to an IPO. And if someone comes along and takes away their money because they're not good money managers personally, I think it's shame on us. You know, it should be, there should be a, a, a moral imperative on the venture capital firm to say, actually, you know, do you have a will? Are your kids taken care of? Do you have a trust? You know, are all these things set up? And so I think that we're not going to do that ourselves. That all comes on the back of partnerships. And so, you know, but, you know, I think there's a lot that's going to happen in the ecosystem as we continue to develop. Funds get bigger, companies get bigger, amounts become more material more people have money. You know, one of the things that I'm excited about is that as Grab goes public, as GoTo goes public, M&A will increase. You look at every other ecosystem in the world, Facebook, Google in the US, Tencent, Alibaba in China, all of these companies expanded horizontally into adjacencies through M&A. I think M&A um, will increase over the next five years. I think that's going to be very exciting. I think as a lot of these companies goes public, you'll have a lot of executives um, that will have liquidity around their stock options. And in every other market around the world, what's happened, you have active angel networks. And so a lot of these you know, executives will then start to invest at the seed stage. And so yeah. then you have a lot more capital flowing into the seed stage, and the whole ecosystem becomes more robust. And I think we're early days in Southeast Asia. It's come a long way, but there's a lot more excitement to come, I think, over the next five years. And there's so many opportunities for banks to be part of that at every stage. Yeah, and just one point I'd, I'd yeah. just add to it, uh, David said, is you know at some point, um, you know the the pools of revenue may not, you know, obviously large banks and all the pools of revenue may not be that large at at the surface at the initial point. But exactly to David's point, which is the initial line of of credit was like 10 million, kind of scaled up, or you know, with with Aaron. You know, the fact that he got that first connection with DBS when nobody else gave it, 
I think those things matter, right? Those things matter to whether you're a GP, whether you're a founder, whether you're a, a merchant that needs that. And I think, you know, as this internet economy is going to, there's no doubt, right? The $30 billion went to $100 billion, $100 billion go to $300 billion. You know, massive opportunities are getting created. And it almost, it becomes interesting or smart if I were, you know, on the other side or, or a bank or DBS is, you know, can you see some interesting profit pools or areas which may look really small right now, but you know what, they're actually going to become really large over time, but can you be the early leader where you've built that relationship with, you know, Aaron at the right time in 2016, 2017, when you know, nobody else was kind of there to support, right? Or from a GP standpoint where nobody's kind of, you know, stepping up or leaning in. Because then later, three, four years later, when this ecosystem goes to that $300 billion and then you're locking up $300 billion going to you know, another $500 billion, you then become like the key partner of choice. Yeah. So again, just something to kind of and think Actually, about. a really good analogy for that is if you look at uh, the law firms in Silicon Valley. Yep. So Wilson, Sensini, or Gunnison, and what they ended up doing is they went into Series A companies and said, we'll do your Series A round for $5,000, you know, or a, a very nominal amount of money. Because then when it became the Series B, they said, well, we use Wilson Sonsini last time, we'll use Wilson again. And then the Series C, and then the Series D, and then the E, and then the IPO. And all of a sudden, there's this, everyone starts using Wilson Sonsini because they're the lowest price point, they've done the most work, they have the most experience. And it's, it's a snowball going down a hill, just getting larger and larger. And so I totally agree that if you can find those kernels of opportunities where you say this will be a very large business in five years, 10 years, and this is the place where we can maximize our position, even though it's very small today, let's own that position today. And we'll say we won't make very much money for the next two or three years, but longer term, we will be the go-to partner. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's the thing that we are also trying to develop. Now, in your example, did the law firm uh, for doing 5,000 work at $5,000, where they're taking some small equity and they built up a pool of equity into these companies? Uh, what, the, what they ended up doing, which is actually not different uh, here in Southeast Asia, is here you can go search for the VEMA documents. Yeah. So the Venture Capital Association here has published standardized documents. And so if you want a term sheet, if you want a, they're coming out with an ESOP plan, a, you know, a shareholders agreement, subscription agreement, they all become standard documentation. And so the process of you know, doing a round um, becomes much easier because it's a lot of the documentation becomes standardized. And so the cost should be lower, yeah. but you can also staff to say, but I think it's, it's less around that. And it's more around taking the long-term view of building a business and saying, we're going to be here for the next 10 years. Let's own this at the very early stage. So when it gets to the later stage, we'll be the biggest firm. Kelvin, one, uh, one question to you, like, uh, now that you are looking for a nonlinear growth in your book, you know, from from lending book perspective, uh, and there are potentially some some technological evolution that you are seeing, but at the same time there are certain competitive dynamics. So, if I were to ask you, what is it that you want to look from a partner financial bank? What would be the ideal choice for you? Where okay, if a bank could do this or ABC, three, four things, then it makes our life in growing uh, the book much easier. And uh, sort of associated with that, do you perceive that there's a change in the mindset? There was a time when some of the banks were looking at you from a competitive perspective, and now they are looking at you from a co-optive perspective, that, okay, uh, they're not eating our breakfast. Maybe the pool is increasing or the pie is increasing because of the participation of fintechs like you. Actually, that's a really interesting one. Um, we did go through almost like a three phase, three phases in terms of our relationship with banks, right? On the very first phase, frankly, we we really had to beg to beg banks to open a bank account for us, and frank, frankly, really. Uh, uh, grateful that DBS eventually opened a bank account for us, and that was the only bank available willing to open a bank account for us. Um, Okay, to be fair, there was another local bank was willing to, but it was, I get KYC calls every other week. Hey, what's happening with this transaction and whatnot, right? So, and like what I think Kabir mentioned, 
um, because DBS Bank was the first bank who was willing to open an escrow account for us. At that time, the concept wasn't even there for, for our industry. And now almost everyone within our industry, if they're going to open an uh, escrow account for, for our space, they're going to go to DBS Bank because of that. So, so it's testament to what Kabir has mentioned. But at the same time, uh, and at that time was also the time when we signed the first partnership between a fintech and a bank, and that was with DBS Bank. Um, and a huge thanks to, uh, to, uh, to the CEO who, who actually supported it. Um, and it was a huge article. I think it was, it was published on Bloomberg, translated into six or 15 plus languages. It was a trending article and whatnot. So that was the first phase. But what we also realized is that a lot of it was, frankly, um, the, the, I think that it was a lot more form over substance. Frankly, mm. a lot of the, the actual collaboration tumbled very quickly, mm. primarily because of a few reasons of the of inherent view that, hey, fintechs are competitors. And, and that's very, very, very ingrained. Even though if you ask people, like, can you give me an example whereby you have lost a deal from, because of fintech? You'll not get any example, but that view is very, very strongly ingrained for a few reasons, right? Partly because I think early days, the fintechs like to talk about, hey, democratizing banking, blah, blah, so and so forth. So frankly, a lot of fintechs talk a big game and it caused some, some level of unnecessary fear. But also at the same time, I find that at that time, a lot of fintechs, the capabilities, frankly, are still quite early. So there isn't that much to actually collaborate on. Um, but I think now we're entering the third phase whereby we start seeing that actually, that there's a maturity in terms of how financial institutions are working with fintechs. I think that it is more substance driven rather than just, hey, another PR. Sometimes I wonder, is that part of a KPI? So like, hey, 10,000 PRs a, a year with, with fintechs. But I find that substance becomes very strong. And I think a few things that we really look out for, and besides what Aaron has mentioned, be it in terms of global, in terms of remittance and so forth, is I think number one, Frankly, the RMs are really, really important. Like we actually choose banks depending on how fast the RMs are, uh, can, can respond to us. Um, because at the end, and of course, how influential can RMs make things work? The reality is that businesses like ours are not very atypical and you almost certainly need someone who is a bit senior who can, who can work, the, work the, the organization to make it happen, right? So, so that RM is very, very important. Whether the person will, 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 will take a Saturday call, and frankly, that's what I usually try to schedule, right? Always, first meeting is always on odd hours and see if the person picks up or not. To see whether if I need the person, the person will actually be there. Um, but so that's one. Number two is also clarity on the end of the tunnel, right? Because what we find is that initially when we work with banks, there are a lot of steps and we, we are fine to go through the steps, but we need to see if there's a light at the end of the tunnel and if and how big is the light and why is the, what's the future of it? Hmm. Or whether the, at the end of the tunnel is another tunnel, right? So, so to us, it's like if there's an end at the t uh, light at the end, I think that's perfectly fair. We can work through it. If you, if you cannot, you can tell us it's fine. Uh, tell us no, that's fine. But I think that that clarity becomes very important. Um, and I think that turning point, frankly, came in during the fifth year mark. Uh, which is similar to, typical to what a lot of banks, uh, banks did. Frankly, we did our got our first financial institution credit line, not from a local bank, from a European bank. And it's not the kind of funky with warrants, blah, blah, blah. So it's a flat, flat loan, flat financing line, and it's from a European bank. And it's mm. not a high interest loan. It was 6.5%. Okay. Uh, so, so, and that's fully loaded costs, including origination fees, legal, blah, 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 and so forth, right? And that's purely unsecured. So it's not like I, I pledge my house whatsoever. Mm. So this is okay. But of course, not all banks are willing to do that. But that was the first, first line that we have gotten because we crossed a five-year line. So we find that the relationship is coming more and more collaborative. Now we have bank shareholders as well. So SMBC Bank just invested in us. Bank Rakyat Indonesia invested in us. I find that the realization that we are truly expanding the pie rather than really competing, I think it's becoming stronger and stronger. So, so I, think, I think that's where we, we see that the activities becomes more and more exciting because hey, we have now there's more maturity within a bank in terms of how to handle with fintechs and frankly fintechs are also better in terms of hey, we have something to offer on the table that we can actually really do this better than you. Um, why not we work together on this front? Good, 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 good. Thank you. That that's very interesting actually. Maybe at this point I will uh, take some questions. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, I think uh, there are some questions which have been posted by audience. So uh, one of the questions which is, uh, you know, for uh, uh, both Kabir and uh, David. So uh, SGX has recently launched a framework for SPAC and uh, would B Capital or Jungle Ventures uh, think about a potentially being a sponsor for the SPAC because you actually have a whole portfolio of companies. So. This is a question from audience. Whether what are your thoughts about being a sponsor for a SPAC? You want me to start? Or? Uh, go go for it. I, I don't think we would. <laughs> okay. So. 
I don't think we would form a SPAC and, um, you know, and I, I, I don't think we would SPAC, form a SPAC and then pick any of our portfolio companies either. Um, and then for um, the SGX generally, you know, I, I think it's a, SPACs are just, in my mind, are an on-ramp to the public markets. There are direct listings, there's a book build, a traditional kind of IPO, there's a SPAC. There's just multiple routes to the same place. Um, and I think for a lot of companies, you just have to say, what's the right exchange? You know, what's the level of liquidity that I'm going to get? You know, how would, how does the market price me vis-a-vis -vis comparables? Uh, different exchanges are pricing companies in different ways, depending on, you know, the liquidity, the, the risk, um, you know, what the retail institutional breakup is, you know, there's lots of different factors. So, um, and I think, you know, it's just, a, it's another opportunity to get on the SGX if you feel like that's the right exchange for you. Your take, Kavi? Yeah, you know, so, and it's, it's out in the public. We, we had, uh, not so much at B Capital, but, you know, four of us uh, at founding partners, we'd explored one in, in one of the US exchanges. Um, but something we just evaluating, considering obviously the SPAC market's also been very choppy. Yeah. Uh, it, the beginning of the year, we were at an all-time high with how much SPACs had raised. I think it had a pretty choppy uh, April to June scenario. But I think, so, you know, to answer your question, it's something we just keep on the radar screen, nothing, you know, active uh, at the moment. But, you know, I think SPACs and overall asset class is definitely interesting. It gives a opportunity for companies to kind of um, access different pools of capital. Um, and so it's definitely an, an asset class. SPACs, if you ask me three years back, there's always a, of three to five years back, there's always a question on what is the quality of assets SPACs would kind of go after from a de-SPAC standpoint. I think that's changed. Um, so I think it's actually become a pretty serious alternative uh, for quality companies as well. And I think it's, you know, next, this year was a choppy year, but, you know, if you think about a five-year view, it's definitely an interesting asset for us. Uh, there's one other question. Um, maybe it's more to Kelvin and or Aaron. Uh, do, you, do you see, I mean, you guys are more in the financing side perhaps, but still weigh in on this question. It is about, do you see some threats to the, you know, BNPL? Like, uh, you know, there is increasingly some realization among regulators that uh, this is leading to such people who, on whom we would like to put some restriction on how much they borrow, uh, people are going ahead and borrowing way more because of the availability. So do you see some threat associated? Of course, there's an opportunity, and that's why there was so much money chasing. But at the same time, do you see some threat emerging around that? I think, like what I roughly say, both threat and opportunities, right? Frankly, of our opportunity side, it's quite straightforward. We do offer SME BNPL, right? Except that we don't serve the consumers, we serve B2B transactions. Yeah. So concepts similar. So I think that that's a huge opportunity. And it's and thanks to the consumer BNPLs, it has helped us to help to educate the market, right? So we don't have to do that much market education by ourselves. Um, but in terms of threat-wise, frankly, our biggest worry is, is spillover effect, right? That the reality is that not made, well, there are many BNPL players are doing it in the right way, in a responsible way. There are also players who are going through the taking advantage of regulatory arbitrage, right? So our primary worry is that if anything goes awry, will there be a regulatory spillover, which happens very frequently in the fintech space, right? So, so we do worry that happened uh, uh, happened to us, and and I think it's only a matter of time whereby regulations come in uh, for BNPL. Nevertheless, the need remains there. Even if regulations come in, I would imagine the industry will still be sustainable, just in a perhaps different way. Aaron, any views in addition to what Kelvin said? No, I mean, said? I fully agree with what Kelvin said. I mean, the, the way I look at BMPL as a space, that is a, it's actually a very tough business. I mean, you look at it geographically, the, the, the folks that did well really affirm in the United States after pay in, in Australia and stuff and whatnot. And the market demographic at that point in time, when we look at e-commerce uh, companies and stuff like that, they, they, don't, they didn't really look at that space or didn't really offer products. And as a result, Companies like Affirm and Afterpay sort of existed and you know did fairly well. But if I if I implemented this in Southeast Asia and by context, I look at Shopee, Lazada, uh, and you know uh, and you know the, the likes of like Tokopedia and whatnot. Uh, I would you know bet and say that I think it is increasingly going to be increasingly tougher to run a BMPL business, primarily because I feel that uh, the the space itself is a very it lends itself to a very captive category. Right. So, you know, if I'm Shopee, I mean, Shopee already does it, right? Shopee Pay and stuff of sorts. 
uh, which you really offer their BMPL solution of sorts. And then you have Tokopedia inkling to you know, do something down there. Uh, and then, you know, the, the likes of the, the, the folks that BMPL companies that have raised a ton of money and I happen to know a couple of them really, really well. Um, uh, I feel that though, that uh, there is more threat to that business model than it seems, right? Simply basically because it is a very captive business. You know, when I, when I buy something from Shopee, I mean, if Shopee only offers me a solution, which is Shopee, whatever that's called, uh, for BMPL, I would have to choose that, right? Yeah. And so as a result, the, the, the pool of BMPL then has to expand beyond that of the digital spend. And then, you know, you go into the, the more traditional folks, which the shop, again, the, the grab pays on one out of the world are doing, right? So then you ask yourselves, how, is, how sustainable is a business model like this in Southeast Asia, whereby the, 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 the fundamental structure of the ecosystem in Southeast Asia is very different. And the competition dynamics of, of a BNPL player in Southeast Asia versus that in Australia or in the United States is very, very different. So long term, I feel that this, this business itself needs to evolve. Uh, whatever they are doing today is, is not sustainable over the long run. As long as the, 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 the giants within the room wakes up to the idea of doing it themselves, you know, they are screwed. Actually, just to add on two points on what Aaron said. One is, I was, I was shocked that at least there was an article, I think one, two weeks ago, whereby a lot of listed BMPLs in Australia had a had their share price tank almost as much as 90 plus percent, meaning that only 10% of value is left so because of higher, because of, you know, of slower growth, higher, cro higher credit costs, uh, loop burning a ton of money, Correct. right? So I think that's an evidence of what Aaron said. And another thing is, I think in Southeast Asia, the dynamics will also be different from what you see in China, whereby I think in China, they had an advantage at the early days of, of force e-commerce platforms, an advantage of forcing users to, to do a two-choose-one, right? That as a merchant, you either do business here or do business there. You can't be doing on both sides. So that gives a lot of data advantage. Whereas in Southeast Asia, A, you either face a captive market situation, like what, what uh, Aaron said. And if you don't get a captive market, frankly, you're only getting a fraction of right. the view of the consumers. How You don't know how much more debt has he already accumulated yeah. elsewhere, right? So... It's very hard for you to have a very clear, clear assessment. Yeah, so overall, bearish. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, maybe this is a question uh, more from one of our, I think, participants who is a founder. Uh, it's either to uh, Kabir or David. Uh, what are the attributes that you look out for in uncovering the next unicorn? Somebody. You know, so l let me answer by saying, what do we look for in a successful business, and then hopefully yeah. valuation takes care of itself, and it becomes a, a valuation. Then you know whether it's a unicorn or not. Uh, but I think from a lot of times we're looking at four or five areas. One is um, it's always important anywhere in the world. I think even more so in Asia is just founder and management team quality. So I think that one is uh, is just so important, which is backing great teams. I think that's kind of the, one of the most important things. I think the second one is, are they going after large enough markets? So is the TAM large? Are they going after an, you know, a large enough market? And then at least where we come into the Series B, Series C stage, is there product market fit? Uh, is there differentiation? Some signs of potentially early market leadership. Um, and then, you know, our you know, fourth point is, you know, our unit economics working, right? So it's, you know, do you have, and different models, LT by CAC, or if it's sales and marketing efficiency, or depending on the business model, is the unit economics kind of working? So I think if you add those four things, at least those are interesting, uh, important ingredients. Uh, and then, then the unicorn part is not fully in your control. Depends on market cycles, where things are, uh, and, and you know how, how things play out. But I think those are things we think are very important. I know David. David, any yeah. any other take on that? Um, no, I mean I, I agree with all that. I think if at we invest at a slightly earlier stage, I think that in addition to the size of the adjustable market, I think one of the thing, two things that we probably spend a lot more time on is around the team in particular, um, it's just their ability to execute. I think one of the biggest things that we underwrite is the execution risk. Um, I think Southeast Asia, fortunately, in most spaces, maybe not so much your space, but most spaces, the competitive intensity tends to be lower. Um, and so if you take an equivalent business and put it in the US or put it in China, you may have 20 competitors or 30 competitors, you know, and there'll be 15 that are venture backed and you may have one or two that are already unicorns, you know, just very intense competition where in Southeast Asia, competitive intensity tends to be lower. So more of the invested capital makes its way into actually building the product and not just fighting with, for marketing or fighting with competitors. And so 
the ability for that team to execute their business model is one of the biggest things that we underwrite too. And then within the team, uh, testing out learning agility is something else that we spend a lot of time on because at an early stage, sometimes you don't end up with the business that you started out with. You know, and your ability to recognize that your product market fit isn't working here, but actually you are solve a problem here. Or the market that you thought was there, there's actually a bigger market over here. Or, and the ability to not be rigid in your thinking and keep going down the same track if it's not working, but to be open to the fact that there could be more market opportunity in different places. And the very difficult thing about that is that you, you also want focus. And so, you know, you're trying to balance this need to not do too much and to stay focused and yet still be open and aware of where other opportunities lie. And so I think those are some of the things that we really test for. And I think if you get that right and you get the capital right, then I think we can create great businesses for B capital to come and invest in downstream. <laughs> good, good, good. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, there are some others which are more like suggestions and uh, potentially a bit of like specific question about whether DBS is funding jungle ventures or not. I will leave those aside. Any other questions? No, but we're open to it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any Anything else uh, that the audience would like to ask at this point or otherwise we have practically come to the close of it? Okay, if not, uh, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot for your time. That was really enriching discussion.